Welcome to the Word of Faith Fellowship radio program. I'm Gerald Sutherland, Associate Pastor of the Church. So happy that you came to be with us today. You know, I was just thinking this morning, uh, through the marvels of the Internet, the technology, uh, this program is seen all over the world, literally. And so it doesn't matter whether you're watching and listening from another part of the world or if you're listening on WCAB radio here in Rutherford, North Carolina. We're happy to have you with us. And it's always a pleasure to be here to share the good things that God is doing and speaking in our lives. I know it's a very difficult time for everybody because of the pandemic that's been going on for the last two or three months. But uh, we have good news, and that is that God's still in charge. God's still in control. He knows the end from the beginning, and uh, so he has a plan for us. One of the things that we are so aware of recently is that God is preparing us for the days ahead. We don't know what the days ahead hold for us, but he does. And so in his goodness and in his mercy, he's preparing us for the times to come. One of those events we know and we're looking forward to is the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Someone asked me one time, well, how do you know Jesus is coming back? And I thought just a moment, and I said, because he said he would. And that's enough for me. He said to his disciples he was going to go away, but he said, but I'll come again. And so since he did say that, and he said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, then we can rest assured that's exactly what he's doing, and he is coming again. But we want to make certain that we are ready for his return. And that's where God's been dealing with our hearts as a church. And I know many of you throughout the world are going through the same dealings of God to get our hearts prepared and ready for his coming. The last week or so, God has really had my attention focused on the subject of humility. And I began to realize as I read the scriptures and as God began to uh, give me revelation on it, that apart from humility, there will be no salvation. No salvation. I want to begin reading today out of Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus was with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi. And he stopped and he asked them, who do people say that I am? And some said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, but who do you say that I am? And that question is resounding in my heart today, and I'm sure in many of your hearts Who do you say that Jesus is? Peter, of course, spoke up and he said, but you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, but Peter, you have had a revelation from God. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. It wasn't a person, a man that told you that. It was my father who was in heaven. It was by divine revelation that Peter spoke it. And Jesus said, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, the the name Peter there has a meaning, as most of the time in the Bible, every name had a meaning. The name Peter meant rock, or small rock. And he said, you're like that, Peter, because you received a revelation from the Father God. But he said, on this rock, and he used a different Greek word here, a different Hebrew word that was translated into Greek. He said, on this rock, which is a huge rock, that rock of revealed knowledge of God, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it, the church, or be strong enough to its detriment or hold out against it, the church. And then in verse 19, and we often overlook this one, Jesus said, I will give you, meaning the church, not Peter, I will give you, the church, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Not the keys to the kingdom. He gave us that, certainly. But it's the keys of the kingdom. It's the keys that give us the strength, the power, the understanding, the wisdom how to operate, how to live, how to function in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the kingdom of heaven is not just awaiting us after we leave this life. The kingdom of heaven is among us and it's with us. 
if we know Jesus, if we're born again. And I began to study this subject of keys, and I, I have in no way suggesting that I've learned all of the keys that Jesus was referring to. But I believe that one of them that he put on my heart is the key of humility. Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind or declare to be improper and unlawful, in other words, whatever you refuse to allow on earth, must be what is already bound or not allowed in heaven. And whatever you loose or declare lawful, lawful or whatever you allow on earth, must be what is already loosed or permitted in heaven. That is a key that I believe that God wants to work in our hearts and in our lives so that we can live in the kingdom of heaven even while we're here on this earth and certainly when we go to be with him. And in the Beatitudes, as they're called, in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught and shared with his disciples on that little hill overlooking the Sea of Galilee. He sat down with them and seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him and then he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed, happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous are the poor in spirit. Who are the poor in spirit? The humble who rate themselves insignificant for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's a key. That with that humility worked in our hearts, that is a key of operating in the kingdom of heaven and experiencing the kingdom of heaven day by day in our lives. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2 says, When swelling and pride come, now, we used to use that expression, the expression when I was a little boy, of people having the big head. This scripture says, when swelling, in other words, you see yourself as bigger than you are, and pride come, then emptiness and shame come also. But with the humble, those who are lowly, who have been pruned or chiseled by trial, the Amplified Bible says, I really feel like during this time that we're going through right now, we're being pruned and chiseled by the Spirit of God if we allow Him to show us what's going on in our lives during these days. Jesus talked about in John chapter 15, the pruning of the vine. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and every branch that does not bear fruit for me will be pruned, will be cut away. That's dead branches. I used to have a lot of fruit trees in my yard many years ago, peach trees. And one thing that I didn't know, a lot of things I didn't know, but one of them was how to take care of fruit trees. So I was just letting them grow, letting the fruit come on them, but there was little dwarf fruit. A man came by one day and he said, aren't you going to prune those trees? And I said, I didn't know I was supposed to. He said, you cut away the dead portion of the limb so that the fresh portion, that which is fruitful, can flourish, can bring forth the fruit. And God is wanting to get rid of the things in our lives that hinder us from being able to function like Jesus did in the kingdom of heaven, even while we're here on this earth how to trust God, how to rely on God, how to believe him for the things that we have need of. We don't know the things that are ahead for us. We don't know the times that we're going to be facing and the, and the conditions that we'll be seeing. But God knows, and so he's preparing us by teaching us his ways, teaching us the things that we need to know in order to live and to survive. So when swelling and pride come, emptiness and shame come. But with the humble who've been pruned or chiseled by trial, and you will be, you will be given opportunity to be pruned and chiseled because there will be many trials facing us in the days to come. But with the humble are skillful and godly wisdom and soundness. I also read in Deuteronomy chapter 8 when God was speaking through his servant Moses to his people. 
and reminding them of how God brought them out of captivity in Egypt and what he brought them through. And he said, and you shall earnestly remember all the way, Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Why did he lead them through the wilderness for 40 years? He said, to humble you and to prove you, to know what is in your mind and heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. God is proving our hearts during these days that we're going through. And he wants to humble us. He wants to bring us to a place where we recognize without him, we're not going to make it. We we sing the song sometime in our church, without him, I can do nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. Without him, I'd be drifting like a ship without a sail, and how true that is. And in these days that we've been living in these last two or three months, especially, we see that we're not going to make it apart from him. Somebody asked me just recently, how do people make it that don't know the Lord? I said, the truth is they're not making it. They're not making it. They may think they are, but they're not, because we need Jesus, the one thing that every human being has in common is that we need a savior and there's only one and his name is Jesus and God said I humbled you to prove you to know what was in your mind and heart whether you would keep my commandments and he humbled you and they allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you recognize, and here's why he allowed them to hunger, so that he could feed them, he could feed them, so that you might recognize and personally know that man does not live by bread only, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So powerful. God said, that's why I led you through the wilderness And there was temptations, tests, and trials at every point. You didn't have water to drink. You didn't have food to eat. But when you turned to me and cried out to me, I met your need. And God still meets our needs today when we turn to him and cry out to him. Going now to the New Testament, James chapter 4 and verse 6. The apostle James says, but God gives us more and more grace. I'm so grateful for the grace of God. That's God actively working in our hearts to turn our hearts to him, to seek him, not only for the forgiveness of our sins, but to seek him for the fulfillment of every single need that we have, whether it's a spiritual need, a physical need, a financial need, or whatever it is, turning our hearts to him, we require the grace of God for that to happen. The power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he says God sets himself against the proud and the haughty. I don't want to be one that God sets himself against because of my pride and my haughtiness. And you know, it may be something just as simple as thinking that I know something apart from inquiring of God. That is still pride. When I think or you think that you can make it without him, you don't need him in your life, when you don't consider him even worth the knowing, that's pride. And God sets himself against the proud and the haughty, but gives grace continually. I love that word continually in the Amplified Bible. He gives grace continually to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. So be subject to God. Humble yourself before God. Just simply cry out to him and say, God, I need you today. And I've already done that today, and I will continue to do that today, that I need Jesus today. I need a Savior today. Not just a one-time experience with God where we can say, well, I remember when I was a child, and, and there was an invitation given to to be born again, to receive Jesus. And I walked down the aisle and I shook the preacher's hand and I filled out a membership card and I got baptized in water. So I'm ready to go to heaven now. And I don't need Jesus. I've done everything I need to do already. 
That's pride. That's false religion. Our relationship with Jesus should be every day. Jesus, I need you today. I need you today, Jesus. I don't know what to do. I don't know the things that are facing me today, but you do. So help me, Jesus. So be subject to God and then resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. And then he says in verse 8 of James chapter 4, come close to God. I exhort you today that are listening, that are watching, come close to God today. How do you do that? You humble yourself before God and say, God, I desperately need you. You know the circumstances I'm in. You know the debts that I face. You know the physical attacks at my body. You know the problems in my home, my marriage, my children. You know all the things that are going on with me. God, if I ever needed you, I need you today. And I want you, God. I want you, Jesus. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Recognize that you're sinners. Get your soiled hands clean. Realize that you've been disloyal, wavering individuals with divided interests and purify your hearts. And then he says, as you draw near to God and be deeply penitent and grieve, even weep over your disloyalty. And I've done that many times. God, forgive me. <clears throat> forgive me, Father. I went away from you. I didn't inquire of you in that situation. Forgive me and change my heart. Get that out of me, Jesus. It says, let your laughter be turned to grief and your mirth to dejection and heartfelt shame for your sins. And then in verse 10, he says, humble yourselves, feeling very insignificant in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. He'll make your lives significant. Isn't that good news? That's what God wants to do. The apostle Peter picked up on that also. And he went on to say in 1 Peter 5, verse 5, to clothe yourself. In other words, put on a garment so that what people see in you is not the outward man, but they see the inward man. Clothe yourselves, all of you, he said, with humility as the garb or the garment of a servant so that its covering cannot possibly be stripped from you. With freedom from pride and arrogance toward one another, seeing yourself as better than someone else, arrogant and thinking that you have a hold of things and you don't need any help for anything. And it goes on, Peter said also, God sets himself against the proud. God sets himself against the proud, the insolent, the overbearing, the disdainful, the presumptuous, the boastful. And he opposes, frustrates, and defeats them. I don't want to be in confrontation with God in opposition to God, do you? Therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you. God wants to lift us up. God wants to make our lives significant. Casting the care, all of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him. Why? Because he cares for you affectionately and he cares about you watchfully. In Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 66 and verse 1, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house would you build for me? And what kind can be my resting place? For all these things my hand has made, God said, and so all these things have come into being by and for me, says the Lord. But this is the man. Now listen. This is the man, the woman, the child, to whom I will look and have regard. He who is humble and is of a broken or wounded spirit and who trembles at my word and reveres my commands. God said, that is the person that I, to whom I will look and have regard. I want him to look upon me with regard today, don't you? Because he sees my heart and he knows that I'm humble before him and that I tremble at his word, that when he says something, I hear him and I listen to his voice and I'm quick to obey him. I delight to do your will, O oh God, should be our heart's desire. I delight to do your will. That's all I want today, Father, is your will. 
You may be out there, you may be saying, well, I've got my own plans today. I've decided what I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, and, you know, you sound like the farmer that Jesus talked about that said, I've got all my barns full and I don't have any place to put all of my produce, all of my crop, all the blessings that God's uh, put upon me. So I'm just going to build more barns. And Jesus said, you are foolish. You don't know. This day your soul will be required of you. And then whose will all of this be? See, we don't know what today holds. We don't know. We have no promise of tomorrow. But we do have the promise that God will have a hold of us and whatever comes. Proverbs 29, verse 23. The Bible says a man's pride will bring him low. And it doesn't take long for that to happen in many cases. A man's pride will bring him low. But he who is of a humble spirit will obtain honor, the honor of God. And also in Proverbs 3, verse 33 and verse verse 34, it says, The curse of the Lord is in and on the house of the wicked. I don't want to be one of those, do you? But he declares blessed, joyful, and favored with blessings, the home of the just and consistently righteous. Though, the, though he, God, scoffs at the scoffers and scorns the scorners, yet he gives his under, undeserved favor to the low, the humble, and the afflicted. The book of Micah tells us, Micah 6, verse 8, He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly and to love kindness and mercy, and to humble yourself, and walk humbly with your God. In Matthew 18, the the disciples were arguing among themselves about who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus brought a little child and put that little child before them. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, unless you repent, unless you change, you turn about and become like little children, like little children, humble Trusting, lowly, loving, forgiving. You can never enter, never enter the kingdom of heaven at all. And I said it at the beginning. There is no salvation. There's no entrance into the kingdom of God without humbling yourself. Jesus said, whosoever will humble himself, therefore, and become like this little child, trusting, lowly, loving, and forgiving, is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit of God, says, Do nothing from factional motives. Do nothing by factional motives, being divisive. Instead, in the true spirit of humility, in lowliness of mind. I like that phrase, the true spirit of humility, because there is a false humility, and false religion is full of false humility, thinking that as long as you're poor, and you don't have a nice house, and you don't have nice clothes, and you don't have nice things to eat, then you're humble. I've known a lot of people in my lifetime that had almost nothing, and they were the most prideful people I ever met in my life. They were almost proud of being humble, being lowly. But there is a true spirit of humility that only God can give. No man can give it. Nobody can work it up. Let each regard the others as better than and superior to themselves. Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interest, but also each for the interests of others. And then he said, let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And then listen to this. Let Jesus be your example in humility. Jesus was humble before God And he showed his humility by his dependence on the Father for everything he did. And the Apostle Paul went on to say, not in your own strength. It's not something that you can do in your own strength. It's God who's all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating you the power and desire both to will and to work of his good pleasure, satisfaction, and delight. Jesus was humble every step of the way, every moment of his life here on this earth, and he's still humble before God. In John 5, 30, he said, I'm able to do nothing from myself independently 
of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God. God. Jesus, the Son of the living God, said, I can do nothing apart from the Father. As I hear, I judge, I decide as I'm bidden to decide, and as the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. Now listen, he said, my judgment is right. Why? Because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. And the apostle said, let him be your example in humility. Pattern yourself after the way he lived in reliance and dependence on the Father for everything that we are, everything that we have. Even the breath that we breathe, we depend upon God for that. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, the Bible says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise and skillful person glory and boast in his wisdom and skill. Let not the mighty and powerful person glory and boast in his strength and power. Let not the person who is rich in physical gratification and earthly wealth glory and boast in his temporal satisfactions and earthly riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me personally and practically, that I am the Lord, directly discerning and recognizing my character, who practices loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Don't pride yourself in what you have. Don't pride yourself in who you are and what you, call, what you can do, what you think you can do. But he says, if you're going to boast in anything, boast in the fact that you know the Lord and that it's the Lord that's at work in you. It's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that I could do. It's nothing that I've produced or could produce. It's nothing that I could say. It's only what God the Father can say. I remember when the centurion came to Jesus and he said, Lord, my servant boy is at home sick, grievously tormented to the point of death. Jesus said, I'll go and heal him. That centurion made a statement that Jesus was astounded about. That man said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just speak the word only and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. I say to my soldiers, do this, and they do it. Jesus said, I've not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. The tremendous faith that was based and rooted in a spirit and the true spirit of humility. In a man that even though he was a Roman, he was a commander of perhaps hundreds of men, forces. He had the power of, of Caesar behind him, he said, I'm not worthy for you to come, to come under my roof. The rich man that came to Jesus said, Good master, what must I do that I might receive eternal life? Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? Who said that? Jesus, the Son of God, said, Why are you calling me good? There's only one good, and that's God. When we recognize that God is God, and I, I love the book of Ezekiel, when you get time, read that. Because numerous times in the book of Ezekiel, God said, these things are going to happen to my people, and I'm going to do this thing and that thing in the midst of my people Israel. And then he says, and then shall they know that I am the Lord. And he says it over and over again, and then shall they know that I am the Lord am the Lord. I want to know that he is Lord today. What about you? When he's Lord, it means he will do, we will do what he says. We'll inquire of him, we'll seek him with all of our heart so that we can know his ways, know his character, so that we can be humble before him. So grateful that you tuned in today to listen to the program. We invite you to listen every day from 8.30 to 9 o'clock on WCAB or on the internet at our website, www.wordoffaithfellowship.org. God bless you. Have a wonderful day and stay humble before the Lord.